Kevin Ruff, Director of General Cardiology at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. It's my pleasure to bring to you today Clot Chronicles and a recap of a very exciting American Heart Association conference in 2020. As you all know, it was done virtually this year, but that did not stop sharing some of the exciting science uh, that's been generated over the past year. For our NATF listeners, I'd like to start off with a very important study, the RIVER study, which evaluated rivaroxaban for valvular heart disease and atrial fibrillation. This trial looked at those patients with atrial fibrillation or flutter and a bioprosthetic mitral valve. We know there's been a lot of controversy about whether NOACs are in fact indicated for patients with valvular heart disease in general, but specifically those who've had a valve replacement. And we know from the NOAC trials, there were lots of patients with valvular heart disease. The NOACs look just as good in those patients, but a lingering question has been regarding those who've had a valve replacement in particular. And we know that there's a contraindication to NOACs in patients with a mechanical heart valve. There were two trials, the Engage AF2B48 and Aristotle trial, that did include patients with bioprosthetic valves in the NOAC first warfarin trials, but they were relatively underrepresented, a total of 200 patients. In this trial, the RIVER trial looked at over a thousand patients, mostly at sites in Brazil, in patients who had atrial fibrillation or flutter and bioprosthetic mitral valve. And importantly in this study, first of all, it was much bigger uh, than our current representation of bioprosthetic valve patients, but allowed patients who had early implantation of a valve. You could enroll a patient uh, as early as 48 hours after implantation. And in fact, about 20% of patients actually were were within that three-month window from mitral valve replacement. And in the traditional NOAC trials, you weren't allowed to enroll patients until three months after a bioprosthetic valve. And the results were very reassuring that rivaroxaban was certainly a non-inferior, robustly non-inferior to warfarin in these patients. But if you actually look at the endpoint we care most about, which is stroke, because uh, that's the mechanism of valve thrombosis or atrial fibrillation, cardioembolic stroke, that that was actually significantly less with rivaroxaban compared to warfarin. And there was a non-significant decrease in major bleeding of 50%. So I think this really puts the issue to rest that NOACs are certainly, in this case, rivaroxaban, an excellent alternative to warfarin in patients with bioprosthetic valves, even early after bioprosthetic valve implantation. In fact, rivaroxaban actually looked the best in patients who had early implantation of a bioprosthetic valve. Um, and so I think really now the only contraindication to no acts of those patients with mechanical uh, valve replacement. Staying in atrial fibrillation, obviously that was treatment of atrial fibrillation and, and valvular heart disease. There was a lot of interest whether we could prevent atrial fibrillation from occurring in the first place. And there had been several trials of vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids for secondary prevention. But there have been a lot of epidemiologic data that patients with low levels of vitamin D and omega-3 were at increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And so the question, therefore, is you know, whether if we give vitamin D or omega-3 supplementation, fish oil, uh, would we decrease the incidence of atrial fibrillation? And in part of a large program called the VITAL program, they look specifically in vital rhythm at atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, supplementation of vitamin D and fish oil did not reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation. So it does not appear that prophylactically giving patients vitamin D or omega-3 will reduce their risk of developing atrial fibrillations, but an important study that I think informs our long-term practice. Now, staying with fish oil, there was a lot of controversy at the American Heart Association. There were two studies with fish oil. One, the STRENGTH trial, which was looking at patients who had dyslipidemia at a high risk for cardiovascular disease. And another trial called OMEMI, which looked at patients who were elderly who had a mild cardinal infarction and looking whether fish oil supplementation decreased the risk of cardiovascular events. And both of these trials ended up being neutral trials that it did not appear that adding fish oil to the regimen decreased their risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. And there's a lot of controversy about these studies because that's in contrast to the reducent trial, which showed that giving fish oil in patients with dyslipidemia, high triglycerides, actually uh, reduced the risk of cardiovascular events independent of the triglyceride lowering effect. Now, what are some of the reasons why we might have discordant 
events, particularly with strength and reduce it. One of the reasons is the preparation of fish oil was different. In the reducer trial, it was a pure EPA, and we know that fish oil can be made up of EPA and DHA. So in reducer, it was a pure high-dose EPA. Uh, and in the strength trial, it was a, a mixed EPA, DHA regimen, a, carboxyl, a carboxylic acid formulation that was thought to be much more bioavailable. And so it's possible that it just matters what type of fish oil that you have, that giving a highly purified EPA is different than get, giving a mixed fish oil. And another aspect that actually came in the discussion of these trials is it may also matter what the comparator is. In the reducer trial, there was a mineral oil used that can actually have some deleterious lipid effects. And in these trials, they actually used a corn oil, which is neutral from a cardiovascular perspective. So it could be a combination of both the fish oil preparation and the comparison that may have impacted the differences in this trials, but certainly has thrown a little bit of the benefit of fish oil in these patients into contrast. And I think we need more information. And then moving on to the management of atrial fibrillation, there were two important studies, the early AF study and the stop AF study. These studies were addressing whether upfront ablation for atrial fibrillation is preferable to a trial of antiarrhythmic therapy. And we know traditionally most patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation will get a trial of at least one, sometimes more antiarrhythmic drugs before they will transition to ablation. We've sort of begun to think that maybe upfront ablation for atrial fibrillation is not only more likely to be durable and successful, but, but maybe better at preventing burden of atrial fibrillation. And these two trials of prioablation showed just that, that if you did upfront ablation, no trial of antiarrhythmic therapy, that you reduce the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Now, whether this translates into cardiovascular benefits to these patients, decreasing adverse cardiovascular events or stroke, et cetera, remains to be seen and needs larger outcome studies. And I think just to end on one of the big blockbuster trials of the AHA that kind of affect everybody in medicine and cardiology of course, was the polypill and the TIPS-3. And again, a very interesting study that looking at a fixed-dose polypill, giving a combination of three uh, antihypertensive regimens plus a statin with a second randomization to low-dose aspirin or not, whether that was beneficial. Uh, this study was done internationally, but mainly in South and Southeast Asia. And it showed that the combination of the polypill plus aspirin a decreased a broad array of cardiovascular events by about 30%. So certainly a very provocative study that maybe this kind of simple approach may have, you know, huge societal implications where we could reduce the risk of MI and stroke in a very easy to give single pill uh, that may aid with compliance. And, and interestingly, uh, this approach may have benefits in both, you know, under-resourced and high-resourced countries. So I don't think that we can just translate these results up purely into resource-challenged countries. So again, an incredibly exciting AHA, lots of wonderful science. Of course, it was done in the era of COVID, uh, and there were also lots of terrific registries that were presented at the American Heart Association that confirmed a lot of the emerging themes that patients with cardiovascular comorbidities are at higher risk of complications being admitted to the hospital, being admitted to the intensive care unit, uh, having complications that lead to morbidity and mortality. Uh, and I think for our NATF listeners, that thrombosis is an important morbid and, and often fatal event in these patients. So clearly there's something about having the COVID infection that increases the risk of both arterial and venous thrombosis. And there's a lots of exciting studies being done regarding whether anticoagulation in these patients improves outcomes uh, in COVID-infected patients. So thank you again. It was a pleasure updating you on some of the exciting science at the American Heart Association 2020, and I look forward to our next update. Thank you. Mm -hmm.